Hello, everyone, and welcome to Insights webinar, uh, co-branded between Harvard Business Review Arabia and MIT Technology Review Arabia. This is Hamoud Al Mahmoud, the editor in chief of HBR Arabia. Amid the current crisis, uh, there was a piece of good news from the type I call the collateral beauty of the crisis. The United Nations e-government survey 2020 was published last week. The report, which is uh, conducted every two years, showed that COVID-19 is pushing more government activities online uh, despite persistent digital divide. The results showed uh, that 65% of the member states are now in high or very high level of AGDI, which is the e-government development index. Also, more than 22% of countries surveyed uh, have uh, moved to a higher uh, level of AGDI. In our region, in the Middle East, uh, we have uh, UAE, uh, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Oman among the very high uh, AGDI countries. Let's dive uh, deep into these insights taken from this report. Uh, uh, we're talking today uh, on the topic of government in the digital era with a spotlight on the 2020 UN e-government development survey that was published last week. We have a great panel today to shed light uh, on this important topic. Uh, First, we have uh, Mohammed Sir, Associate uh, Partner, uh, Digital Government and Public Sector Consulting at EY uh, MENA, uh, Ernest uh, Young. Mohammed has a rich experience working with uh, many governments around the globe, helping them to move the, to a digital uh, government or e-government uh, mode. Uh, he worked with the UK government, Singapore, New Zealand, and uh, many more, and now he's in the region of Middle East and North Africa. We have also uh, a panelist, uh, uh, Arbine uh, Korikian. She's uh, a governance and public administration officer at the Division for Public Institution and Digital Government at UNDESA, UN Department of economics and social affairs. The third uh, panelist we have, uh, Marta uh, uh, Arsoviska Tomoviska. Uh, she's the director at, uh, she's a director uh, of the PAR team, uh, performance assessment uh, review. And she's an advisor for IT and e-government at the office of the prime minister of Serbia. So as you can see, we have uh, diversity of panelists who can enrich this very important topic from different perspectives. We will listen to a 10 minutes um, presentation from each uh, panelist. Uh, then we will have a panel discussion and we'll take your questions, our great audience. Uh, so please make sure uh, your questions will be sent through the Q&A button, not the chat box, please. So welcome all uh, our panelists. Welcome Mohammed, Arbine, and Marta. Thank you. It's great to well, be here. Thank you. And we'll start with uh, Mohammed uh, Sir uh, from EY. Mohammed uh, will give us uh, a presentation, uh, reimagining government for digital era. So to you, Mohammed. Thank you. Let me just uh, get the presentation on. So starting with Mohammed, uh, we'll have uh, like an overall perspective because he have, as I said, uh, the rich uh, experience and background. Mohammed. Thank you. I hope my screen is, you can see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So just to set the scene uh, before I get into the actual slide itself, I tried to keep it quite light and uh, informative as you asked me to, and to be a little bit disruptive and futuristic in the thinking of, of uh, uh, today and trying to sort of maybe get us a bit uh, open to thinking of different uh, concepts and different ideas. And I just wanted to, before going into that, just talk a little bit about 
the the thinking process or the thought process uh, what got me to this and it's something that i've been for some time now thinking about uh, as an individual uh, who some years back started to think about purpose of life you know why do i exist as a human being in this world and you know sometimes we have this moment in our lives where we we start to think about these things and it it dawned on me that the area for me was about making a difference in people's lives and that became the kind of uh, i would say pivotal point for me when i re re came in uh, re changed my career purpose and focus into into government and focus on government and and trying to see how we can look at bringing purpose to government uh, through technology so so that's the kind of background and i've been doing a lot of this thinking discussing with many different people mata is one of them and uh, arpani as well on what the future looks like for us what's happening around us and is it now the time for us to rethink or reimagine government rather than look at transformation that we are doing today so that's the kind of context i just wanted to set and i will try and go through and talk about the environment we are in today what's happening that i see and where that is going what's changing in our world and how that's going to become an impact for us in governments around the world and what should we potentially be doing and which direction we should be going in if we want to really embrace all of these different benefits that we have today of technology so the first thing is really the world we live in today and i wanted to really bring a lot of complication that uh, of information to a very simplest simplistic message if you think so not so long ago we were really focused on doing many things individually we were working separately we were uh, going and entertaining separately we were connecting with people separately all of those things were happening in in separation on individual levels all of that is either collided or is being collided into one device that we have today which is a mobile and most of it is shifting towards an online space so there's been a catastrophic change in the way the whole environment around us works we have pretty much now doing everything that we can do today online a, a lot of things we can do there's still a room to uh, there are gaps there are many things we can't do as physical but today's world has changed quite significantly so that's one message i wanted to share the second was that if you look at what's happening there is forces that is even going to further change and actually speed up the change of all of these things that are happening around us you you've got now like 1.2 billion 5g connections projected to be by 2025 41.6 billion connected devices by 2025 look at the amount of data we are going to create and what's the most interesting for me is how as an individual person we are most likely going to be every second every 18 second of a day somehow doing some kind of connection whether it's ourselves through mobile to someone else or device to device so this a huge amount of change happening around us and this is only going to be further further enhanced and, and uh, i would say uh, accelerated also all of this is kind of leading towards what i call the deep and ambiguous digital world we are shifting towards potentially from just online to maybe virtual reality or even extended reality becomes a space where a lot will happen in the future internet of things is going to maybe explore the way we connect and all devices and people are connected if we look at the AI itself how that is being leveraged today and we've seen a lot of good examples of that and even the uh, EGDI uh, report the survey report shows some examples of that so we are, we are seeing a lot of this and most importantly quantum computing now we are starting to see a lot of uh, talk about how the power of quantum computing will change or could change our life so these five things are really i would say shaping our future world and of course covid-19 has put a absolute spotlight on this changed world what's happened is it wasn't that the world wasn't changed it's changing and we were incrementally feeling it 
what COVID-19 did was actually make us realize how much our world has changed because we weren't really putting a focus on it. We weren't thinking about it. And all of a sudden we have the whole world trying to work, play, entertain, educate online because we couldn't move. And this is actually being significantly now, I think going to be speeded up because I think COVID-19 is giving a tailwind to the change of going into this next phase of what I call the digital world. You quoted some of these examples earlier, but just look at how much achievement we have made as governments around the world. We have shifted tremendously and, and hats off to the work that uh, you and Dessa has been doing and Arpine and Vincenzo. Really, it's, it gives a, a, a great, uh, I would say, benefit to the whole, whole of world where we see a lot more countries moving up into the higher ranking we see a lot more member states having moved, you know, to higher GDI groups since 2018, just in two years, you know, a big, big change. So these shifts, I think, are making a big difference. And we are seeing a lot of benefits that governments are deriving from digital technologies. And then when we actually look at um, where we are heading, you know, if today is where we have one device and we are online, we are moving towards multiple devices and human connected, device to device connectivity, human to device connectivity, the virtual world, much more hyper-connected. And that shift is, is profound because it's going to become much more easier for us individual level to even reach out to government and interact with government. So that's a big, big shift that I'm seeing. So all of these kind of moving parts are moving us in this direction where our world of next and beyond is going to be much more 24 by seven on online and our devices probably acting on behalf of us, you know, rather than we having to take action, the virtual assistants we may have in the future will take actions for us or our device to device actions will become much more prevalent in the future. Just, uh, and then when I look at uh, what basically, you know, we, we are doing now, if we think of these changes, we are moving then into a direction where really we need to fundamentally maybe think about asking some questions as a government because the environment that we are working in and living in today has changed so significantly. Uh, at least if I can go back to my time when I was in the UK government, that's 30 years back when I started my career. Between then and now, I have not seen a significant shift in the operating model of government. There have been many iterations, but I've not seen a, a re, re fundamental shift in the way we operate. We're still doing most of the things. And the focus has been a lot on how can we make digital do the things we do today much better. So I feel we need to start to ask questions like, why do we do what we do today as governments? Are these things actually even needed or are they redundant? And if they're needed, are we as government the right institution or organization to actually do them? And most importantly, what is it that we're not doing today that we should be doing to fulfill our obligation as a government to our citizens and other stakeholders? So this to me means that we need to really reimagine the role and model of government. We need to go beyond thinking just digital transformation. It's a paradigm shift that we need to be thinking about because our world around us has changed so significantly. Just looking at digital transformation on its own will not get us to that future point where we should be wanting to become, if we want to be much more connected with our citizens and deliver the value they're looking for their government to deliver. Sorry. Excuse me, a bit of problem with the side. Okay, and then what in my uh, perspective, that basically means that we are needing to look at a radical change in the model, not just an incremental change in the model. And one which, as I've said, is built around the uh, citizen centricity as its core, 
and is built ground upwards, it's our opportunity to think around and say, how can we really do what we were doing and fulfilling our core purpose as a government in a much more efficient and effective way? And if I look at the, the, the journey, you know, from conventional government, we move to e-government and we move to a digital government, I think the time has come when we need to look at moving towards what I class as a smart government. It's, it's not about pure technology alone. It's about business model change, operating model change, in addition to technology being used as the enabler. And I see a smart government, which is really having the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills much more quickly and efficiently than governments have been able to, to do. We must be responsive as a government. And COVID-19 has showed that we can be as governments responsive. It's not that we can't. And I see the guiding principles of, of, of this government to be shifting from just looking at delivering services to actually trying to look at how I can as a government change the lives of people and being what I call citizen life experiences focused and having at its core and its operating model of the future being built around data and analytics. Looking to leverage a model of ecosystem rather than looking to do everything themselves, emphasizing on you know, digital first uh, by default, always questioning if this can be done in a automated way through using the power of digital, why not do it? Why should humans be the one who actually are doing that and being obsessed in my opinion with the outcome based results. So rather than looking at delivering outputs, looking at delivering outcomes that really make a meaningful difference in the, in the lives of people. So if I take an example of what that possibly could look like if we look forward, and I look at one of the most fundamental of the areas that needs to be reimagined, and that's the interaction between governments and its people. Look at what it is today, how challenging, how difficult potentially it is for citizens to be connected with its, is it government, to voice their voices, to be heard. Today, we have a many to one relationship. We have a you know, onus on the citizen to make the effort to have a vo voice heard in most cases, not in all, but in most cases. And we need to be looking at, you know, moving towards, you know, a uh, society basically where they are getting the value out of the whole value proposition of, of government being there and shifting towards where is a one-on-one -on -one relation. It wouldn't be beautiful if I as an individual felt that I'm the only one who exists in the country because the way the government is connected with me is as if I'm the only one. Having a two-way interaction rather than a one-way communication. Today is much more um, a one-way. I uh, connect with the government or I maybe, you know, uh, 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 represent, uh, you know, select my representative. But once my representative has been selected to voice in, in parliament, after that, the connection is broken. What happens? The promises have been made by the, to the constituencies, by the, the individual. Are they being measured, monitored? Am I telling my citizenry that this is what I'm doing? I, I promise you these things. And then looking at tailoring life experiences so everyone feels they are getting the experience of life they want to get. Thank you. Back to you, Hamoud. Thank you, Mohammed. It was uh, very uh, inspiring and actually uh, uh, it's raising uh, many questions uh, we can ask you later on. But let's uh, move to Arbine, the second uh, panelist. Arbine, she's um, representing the UN department, uh, which is uh, was responsible. Uh, I mean, this department was responsible for this survey and conducting the survey. So uh, Arbine, she's uh, going to present us uh, uh, some facts and uh, insights from uh, this uh, 
a new survey. So uh, it's uh, to you, uh, Arbine, we're all ears. Thank you, Hamoud. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to discuss uh, the e-government survey and share some of the results. And uh, the topic is obviously very interesting, the future of digital government, and well in our purview. So I'm very happy to be able to share that. Um, do you already see my screen? <clears throat> yes, now okay. it's launching. Yeah, great. OK. So um, what's um, the one of the things that we wanted at the UN when we started uh, to work um, on the digital government and it initially uh, e-government actually almost uh, two decades ago, we wanted to have um, a benchmarking reference on e-government as well as uh, help the policymakers with, and decision makers on the policies that support the e-government. And uh, that's what the e-government survey is basically all about. And the way we do it is that we do survey, <clears throat> um, um, e-government survey every two years um, around the world for 193 member states uh, that tries to measure the advancement of governments um, in the e-government development overall. So uh, the EGDI, uh, the index itself, e-government development index, um, has three main components, equally weighted three components. It looks at the online services, the scope and quality of online services provided by the member states. That's the OSI, what we call it. Uh, we look also at the status of development of telecommunication infrastructure in a given country at that point in time, as the TII, telecommunication infrastructure, and we look also at the inherent human capital um, or what we call human capital index in each of the country as a set of indices that um, show as a proxy of countries readiness to use the online services. Uh, each of the components itself has its own uh, subset of um, indicators, small indicators that we collect. The telecommunication infrastructure index, for example, Arbine, can, has... you, can you make it a uh, presentation mode so it can be, yeah. Can you one. see it better? Yeah, and as, now yes. it's better. Thank okay, you. good, sorry. So the telecommunications infrastructure index that is one of the components of EGDI is focusing um, usually on four to five different indices. This year, there has been four of them. Internet users uh, per 100 inhabitants, mobile subscription per 100 inhabitants, active mobile broadband subscriptions, and fixed broadband subscriptions per 100 inhabitants. And we take this data from the Telecommunications Union International, ITU, uh, as of the almost a few months before the survey is released, the latest that they have. This year, for example, it has been 23rd of December, 2019. So over the time, of course, we look into the uh, digital development of uh, trends and then what's changes in the landscape, et cetera. And hence the telecommunication infrastructure index looks at a slightly different subset of indicators without keeping, uh, without changing much at the core of the things that we need to look into it. Uh, this um, table actually summarizes how it has been changed since 2001. And as you can see at the very last, part of the table. The television sets that has been part of the measuring um, the telecommunications infrastructure of the countries by ITU has been dropped, dropped since 2018 uh, because it's no longer represents uh, the people's experiences on digital or uh, e-government uh, you know, world. Uh, this year, another new change has been introduced that we dropped also the fixed telephone subscriptions because many of the countries that are trying to use the modern technologies in um, organizing the um, mobile subscriptions or internet subscriptions, and then they do not longer rely on fixed telephone subscriptions, would have been disadvantaged compared to those that have been traditionally um, oriented and had those infrastructure uh, ready even before the uh, digital trans transformation started. So this slight changes may um, slightly uh, change the uh, overall scores, but at the core of it, it doesn't uh, completely disregard the continuity of the survey. You can still continue when it comes to, uh, compare when it comes to most important indicators. So the human capital index as well, um, is looking into the gross national um, 
enrollment rate, the expected years of schooling, the measured years of schooling and adult literacy. And we take this data from UNESCO uh, most of the time. There are cases when countries don't have UNESCO uh, provided information and we rely on UNDP, Development Program, UN, for uh, the similar subset of indicators. And we take the latest as possible, again, uh, in December, usually of the uh, year before preceding the uh, survey publication. And um, I know that many people um, and the many governments are uh, curious about the whole thing and why we do take the human uh, capital index into consideration of e-government development as all, uh, overall. Uh, you need to be mindful that uh, technology alone will not serve the people if they are unable to use it. And literacy skills, as well as the digital literacy skills, become more and more important in the current world to uh, rely on the government services, to use them online, to uh, not be left behind. And these considerations are important. Uh, the slide has um, actually pr provided definitions of each of the uh, sub-indicators of HCI, uh, so as the survey. So if you're interested in understanding how it has progressed, please refer to it. Or if you ask the question later on, I will be more than happy to address it. I don't want to bore you with a lot of technicalities. Uh, just to mention that, the again, uh, in line with the... <clears throat> Uh, technology development and as well as how the uh, human evolution progressed. Uh, we, about, uh, we in 2014, we introduced a couple of new sub indicators for human capital index, uh, including the expected years of schooling and means years of schooling as a proxy to assess what uh, the quality of the human capital uh, available in the country. This is as a snapshot for the uh, two subcomponents of EGDI that are not under purview of uh, UNDESA. We take that from ITU and UNESCO. What we do in house is we assess the online services index. Um, and in 2020, we had 148 questions that has been uh, screened and assessed for each member states, uh, usually at least by two native speakers. Sometimes it's even three or four, depending on um, whether there is a need for that as, or not. And each of these questions calls for a binary yes or no answer. Sometimes we dig deeper and then we ask questions whether if it is a yes, uh, what, uh, whether the services uh, provide, for example, if the data, the data is provided, public data is provided by the government portal, whether the data is in machine readable format, machine non readable format, etc. So these are additional layers of quality assessments, which are also factored in, in yes or no answers. So every positive answer generates uh, more in-depth questions and allows us to us assess the level of e-government development in each member state. Once we do the assessment, um, the total number of points scored by the governments on the website assessment uh, are normalized in the range between zero and one. And that's what provides the ranking. Uh, so that's for the OSI. Once the OSI is done, we then move to generating the EGDI using the other two components as well. And we have a list of criteria that do the assessment of the, you know, we do the quality assessment of the data. There are several layers of the um, cleaning the data, uh, making the consistency checks with the previous survey. If we notice that, for example, the trends in one country is too uh, jumping up or dropping too significantly, we definitely look into the country and check each link uh, collected by the um, uh, online volunteers and when they were doing the assessments. We make sure that certain subset of online uh, survey questions are spot checked and then uh, random checks allows us to also see whether there are any irregularities. And it goes actually to two, three rounds of, usually two, three rounds of uh, quality control checks before the OSI's final calculation is performed. Once the OSI calculation is done, then we incorporate also the data from um, ITU and UNESCO on human capital development and infrastructure development. And that's how the final EGDI is calculated. This is also pushed and normalized through zero to one scale so that it can be comparable um, with the previous surveys. 
So but I will not spend too much time on giving you the global original um, uh, snapshot because Mohammed has already covered uh, the main points. Uh, almost 65% of the member states currently have high and very high GDI level. And in a map, these are the uh, darkest shades of the blue. And there is a significant progress from one group to another. Uh, in 2020, uh, 57 countries are in he high EGDI group compared to only 40 in uh, 2018. And this year, I want to note that there's only eight countries in the world that are scoring with low EGDI levels. Seven of them are in Africa. So uh, as Mohammed also mentioned, 22% uh, or 42 member states have moved from lower to higher GDI level. This map represents the change. And the darker the shades, the higher the transition is, for example, from high to very high GDI level. Uh, it's very encouraging to see that in, even in Africa region, there are 15 countries uh, or almost 28% of the continent has moved had had a positive upward movement, nine in Americas, 11 in Asia, and seven in Europe. Uh, Oceania is the only region where this uh, dramatic move didn't happen, but they still have uh, fairly um, advanced, I mean, they advanced compared to where they extended in 2018 as well. Um, I will not again talk too much in detail of the um, uh, leading countries. There are 14 this year. Uh, Denmark is leading the global EGDI ranking for the second consecutive year. Republic of Korea is leading in online service provision and Estonia has the most significant ascent since 2018. Uh, Traditionally, Europe is leading uh, for the last several publications, the regional uh, rankings, and eight member states come from Europe in the highest group, uh, three come from Asia, two from Oceania, and only one country from uh, the Americas the, as a regional distribution. This slide is just to illustrate you the important shift that happened. The blue dotted line represents the EGDI global average in 2018, and the red uh, line represents um, the average EGDI in 2020. As you can see, it has increased from 0.55 to 0.60, uh, which is significant. And Europe, uh, which is here, as you can see above the uh, red line, all countries are above the red lines, is, um, has the scores above the global average nearly all countries. Um, Oceania and Africa have majority of the countries still having below the EGDI uh, average scores, but overall the positive shift is obvious. So um, wanted to also focus on one thing which member states always ask. Uh, yes, the income levels tend to correlate positively with the uh, EGDI high scores and countries that have higher incomes tend to have higher EGDI scores, but it's not universal. It's of course doesn't determine the progress. Uh, the uh, provision of all services pays off and there are many countries in low and lower middle income groups that have advanced their online services provision and hence pulled their EGDI performance overall upwards. Uh, in fact, actually the fastest improvement in EGDI score ha happened exactly in the lower middle EGDI group by about 15%. So um, I want to also mention that trends in online transactional services provisions are also very positive. Uh, more countries, um, as Mohammed mentioned, 84 countries um, in the world provide at least one and on average 14 services online. Uh, this graph represents that Europe, for example, which is the outer um, lilac line, is providing the most services uh, globally. 70% uh, of the countries have all 20 services that we assessed, um, but expansion of online services is moving very fast in all other regions as well. In Americas and Asia, 60% of the countries offer 16 out of 20 services that we assess online. And in Africa and Oceania, it, uh, this number is 50% countries offer 12 to 14 services. Uh, before I move to the region, um, the Arab region countries, I wanted just to highlight one more finding that uh, the survey uh, keeps um, us like keeps us worried a little bit. The affordability of mobile broadband remains an issue. Online services provision cannot be disconnected with affordability of the such services. And as you can see on the right uh, corner of the bar chart, Africa uh, uh, pays much more uh, percentage of its uh, gross national income uh, 
um, uh, as a cost of active mobile broadband compared to all other regions. Oceania has the highest, uh, second highest uh, percentage. And as you can see in Europe, it's only 0.8%, uh, 0.8% uh, of the uh, national gross national income goes to uh, paying for active mobile services. These disparities uh, make it harder for people to use online services and advance the government development. So significant improvement has to happen here for um, all regions to advance together. Uh, so my um, uh, couple of last slides, two last slides that I want to focus on. I know that many of you are joining us from the Arab region. That's the Economic and Social Commission for West Africa for the United States, uh, United, United Nations, I'm sorry. And um, out of 18 countries that are covering uh, by the regions, you can see how some of them are in Africa, some of them are in Asia. So for you to uh, read your regions, you need to uh, dwell into the regional developments of both regions. Uh, and as you can see in Africa, there are still countries um, from the region that has low uh, EGDI, that's South Sudan, for example. But overall, most countries have middle and high and very high EGDI uh, development. Uh, the uh, Gulf cooperation countries um, have even like, uh, as, they, as a subgroup, they perform similarly. That's why we even created a special graph and uh, tables for the Gulf cooperation countries. And you can see United Arab Emirates is leading charts in the region uh, overall and in the Gulf cooperation countries. But we also have many countries that are uh, made transitions like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and Oman moved from high to very high GDI levels. Saudi Arabia they joined for the first time the very high GDI group. Um, but I wanted to also mention, I'm not going to bore you with a lot of charts and details, but you know, just to highlight that uh, there are divergences. If you want to understand better the country's development and in the region as well, you need to look into divergences between the uh, different subcomponents, OSI, TII, and HCI. For example, Jordan and Morocco have uh, rather high um, human capacity index and uh, developed uh, telecommunication infrastructure. Yet their OSI level and those services pr provision is at the middle level. Uh, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Arab Republic have uh, high human capital, but they have pretty um, middle uh, TII and middle OSI performance. So this kind of analysis gives you a, a better understanding of where the country needs to invest more and what kind of issues they need to pay attention to. Uh, similarly, for Saudi Arabia, although it's in very high OSI group and GDI group, uh, the uh, very high GDI group, it has a very high human capital and high infrastructure, but it has a room to improve its online services provision. Even though it's part of the very high GDI group, you can see that there is still a little bit of room to improving the online services. Uh, similarly, uh, it, it doesn't mean that always it's a negative thing. Egypt, for example, have a uh, high online services index, despite having middle uh, human capital and telecommunications infrastructure. So it does pay off to invest also in online services um, as a main way to lift up the country's government development overall. Uh, so I will, before I stop, I want to once again highlight the very key things that uh, happened in 2020. E-government levels have improved globally, income levels support, but they do not determine the progress. The online service provision has expanded in all sectors. We didn't talk much about vulnerable groups right now, but it's also a positive trend globally. The national portals has improved, the procurement services, online recruitment has improved globally. But we need to be mindful that affordability remains an issue um, of mobile broadband and digital divides remain in all regions. If you do have interest in understanding um, all these trends more, uh, please go through the online uh, uh, publication of the e-government survey itself. We also have um, a, a series of webinars that are dwelling into the details of each of the chapter of the publication. Well, for example, we uh, started with the global and regional development and the COVID-related um, responses by the pandemics this year. Today, we're going to have in a couple of hours the uh, webinar on online, um, on the local level of government. And do please follow also us um, next week on the, issue, the data for e-participation, data governance for digital government, and capacities in digital transformation. Those things are online. You can register, follow up, and view the recording later on. 
I will be here to answer your questions um, or provide me more explanation on, um, you know, the methodology of the work that we're doing, um, as well as some of the key trends that you would want me to highlight. Uh, but let me stop here and then give the floor back to Hamon. Thank you. Thank you, Arbine. It was uh, very informative, actually, and uh, many people, uh, including myself, would have uh, a lot of questions to ask. Uh, so um, we'll move uh, first to the next panelist, um, our uh, guest from uh, Republic of Serbia, uh, Marta. Marta, she's, uh, she's working as an advisor for IT uh, and e-government at the office of the Prime Minister of Serbia. It's very important to listen to Marta because uh, Serbia actually uh, on the top of uh, high uh, EGDI countries in this uh, survey. And uh, we share, I mean, I, I guess, uh, I assume uh, as in the region, we inherited a lot of uh, bureaucracy in our countries. So Serbia managed to, uh, to formulate the e-government uh, uh, struggling or uh, escaping from the old uh, you know, bureaucracy we all had. So it's, uh, it's important to listen to her, to, uh, to you, uh, Marta, and uh, we'll follow by questions, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hamoud, and thank you to uh, inviting me to this panel. It's such a great company. And let me uh, mention that I really feel great about this panel because we have a number, a huge number of, of, of people in the audience uh, from the entire world and, and for the region as well. Uh, so um, I just want to um, add on what um, Arpin, uh, she, she was uh, talking about where we are, where the world, world and digital governments are in the moment. And Mohammed kind of show us the way uh, for the future. And let me, let me try to um, uh, help everybody in the audience uh, uh, think about how can we do that? Because I have been involved with the governments a long time. I am uh, personally now a, a, a advisor to the Serbian prime minister, but prior to that, I was a, my, a minister myself in the Macedonian government and I was leading the e-government reform. I was leading the um, public administration reform, including ICT, development of the IT society at all. I also work for the United Nations, for the International Telecommunication Union as an innovation uh, uh, expert. So I kind of, um, you know, have the experience from, from the inside, uh, inside the governments. Um, I just want to, and being present now uh, in, the, in the government, in the Serbian government due to the time of pandemics, I just want us to think how can we embrace the momentum that has been caused by the, by the pandemics. I will share my screen uh, as for the presentation I have prepared. Okay, um, yes. Okay, so um, we still, we, all of us due to the pandemics are, are taken out of our comfort zones. Government, oh yeah, they, they have been, especially shaken and put to tests. So let me show you some pictures here. Um, this is a baby, a newborn, half an hour after she has been born uh, in, in, in South Korea. Um, this, this one is a virtual wedding that just happened uh, recently in Denver, Colorado. And this is the um, ice skate park in, in, in Madrid that has been transformed in huge morgue. And these are the 14 days of quarantine uh, that happened, that, that uh, the stamps that were giving to people uh, back in Mumbai. Oof. Um, so all of this is a government business. You see all of this. So uh, governments, um, governments, um, uh, they, they uh, arrange for the births, uh, for the marriages, um, for the deaths. And there, all services had to be reorganized because of the COVID crisis. What, what really happened uh, and were we ready? So we have to change the paradigm. The governments had to change the paradigm. 
the questions that we all ask ourselves before the crisis was what happens if the website goes down? You know, government um, um, obsessed with the government services and a better uh, customer experience. The nightmare was if the website goes down. Now we have another nightmare. What happens in physical, if physical offices and schools go down. This is exactly what happened. So rules of the game change, our customers change, the requirements change, behaviors change, expectation change almost overnight. And this is a second time in a row because the first time when these rules of the game change was the disruption that was caused by technology, you know, that has been the fourth industrial revolution and some and, and things change. But now with the crisis, it has been changed to a uh, uh, to a stage that that we as a result of that we witness many interesting things that helped us to stay relevant. So what we've seen it was a rapid acceleration of digital innovation and transformation, and we have basically compressed years worth of technological and advancements into weeks and into months. And what else we were seeking bottom up solutions and and insights. Uh, so uh, building um, um, with ideas and solutions to come from citizens and so small businesses. And this is how incrementally we have solved the problem. So this was the real situation. Where I, I'm just joking. Uh, when uh, Sally meets Harry, momentum. Basically, when public sector meet innovation, momentum, like more, more than ever before. So can we use this momentum and make it momentum, like make it, make it, make it last? Because what we have done now, we should keep and, you know, um, extend it over the period of time. Because what, what is the essence here is that we, uh, I, I guess you know the innovation paradox, but uh, I'm going to repeat it for everybody, is that everybody, including governments, they always say, companies, I mean businesses and, and governments, they say they don't have business for, they don't have time for innovation because they have to focus on uh, and to do better what they do. So they are occupied with the, the daily businesses, you know, daily activities. And there's no, basically there's no time to, to consider the future and to think about future on innovation strategies and so on. This was not the case. We did have time to think about, you know, the future because otherwise we couldn't, we, we couldn't survive basically. And then based on them, I can, I, I, I will use myself and I suggest to everybody that has been doing a business uh, or working for the government to use the same innovation strategies that are similar to the business sector. Why? Because similar to the business sector, but governments are the largest employer, they are the larger, largest service provider and they're the biggest data owners. So when we think about you know, e-government basically, we think about e-governments is one uh, part of the e-commerce. And when we, we, uh, what is the customer experience we want to achieve? We want to achieve the same customer experience that Amazon, for example, offers to us. So let us think business-wise. And if we think business-wise, we will think innovation. And I, I would like to share uh, with the audience some examples of, of that I teach when I teach innovation strategies for for the for the companies, basically those are the innovation strategies that have been used by three dinosaurs, and they're not the usual suspects. The companies that you everybody will think that will innovate, like I don't know Google or or, or Amazon or or Facebook. No, those are three companies that are old, believe me. So Starbucks is more than 50 years and Ford and, and BMW is more than a century. So uh, as part of their strategies, the most important strategy is the focus of, on, of, on customer experience. That's number one. And that should be the number one focus uh, while designing services as well for the government. Uh, Starbucks has been very famous for empowering their employees, for engaging customers, and this is how they have done to their, you know, um, this writing on the on the cup that has been viral and then has gave them a, a, a most uh, market share, the biggest market share. Uh, 
and they afford uh, as well to to make mistakes uh, uh, by experimenting and to to accept small risk and fail this is what the government should act uh, then fourth in their strategy is that they never innovate for the sake of innovation but they innovate to solve problems because someone said ideas fail problems fail stay bet on the problems and then they are looking for analogies and cross-pollination in different industries. Experimentation, experimentation, experimentation. What BMW did, uh, 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 they, they, are, they are looking beyond the horizon. They, uh, they are fortifying um, themselves by improving core business, but at the same time starting to explore and create portfolio of options. And uh, what, what was really interesting for me uh, is that I learned today uh, by my, my, my colleague, my friend, the, the director of the CTO of Google, he shared some news on the LinkedIn and it was beyond my expectations. Ba basically BMW, they started to offer in-app services in a car. Imagine you can buy a three months of seats heating feature in a car online so why don't we why why can't we why can't we uh, the governments offer something similar can we in for example in our mobile e-gov app uh, subscribe and pay to three months for example transfer services for our school bus or or uh, or buy the three months lunch or meals for our kindergarten kids you see so there is there are analogies that we can use from the business sector on the on their innovation strategies how do we innovate in government so we achieve the future that mohammed was talking about so this is the way how do we get there so but clearly uh there have been innovation culture for this you know and uh because we we have already agreed before uh, that the, the innovation is more than just a technology it is a business design and it's breaking the silos and hierarchies and amplifying the potential of people and perpetual learning but governments they have problems with this because they usually say we are the government so you know we have the pride in what we do we are the smartest we are the best we are much better than others the truth is that the government have to be humble and to be curious and to be agile and to be open to learn so we should have in the governments the growth mindset and the biggest battle the governments have to win is that of their mindset so they should ask for help they should go and talk with the startups they should open innovation challenges they should provide service design and design design thinking courses for example for employees they could they should open government GovTech labs accelerators and so on and so on so uh, if governments do that and uh, the innovation then becomes part of their fabric rather than just one time thing that happened if they're lucky or because of the pandemics you see and this is uh, called the uh, innovation culture so the um, basically um my my point at the end is that the government should uh, start innovating like a startups and this is well presented on this picture thank you thank you so much uh, marta it's really an interesting and now i can see uh, why you have this uh, rich career you look very uh, uh, enthusiastic and following every uh, details and trends uh, in your area. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll start um, uh, the Q&A panel. Uh, I'll, I'll start by asking uh, our panelists some questions and uh, I'll embed the questions uh, received from uh, our great audience. I will start with you, uh, Arbine, as you are representing the, the, the division of the uh, United Nations uh, that uh, published uh, this survey. So um, my question is, um, in, in, this, in this report, I, I saw like an emphasis uh, um, saying that the digital government transformation is, is not just about technologies. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's uh, right. about right. all uh, about um, public governance, transformation, innovation, and uh, describe uh, everything uh, like a, a huge mindset uh, of 
uh, government uh, transformation. So tell us more, because some people would think that, okay, having a website or some e-services uh, would, would make mm -hmm. the government uh, e-government. Uh, that's right, and thank you very much for the question. Um, excellent um, one. I think your question could come um, timelier right after uh, Marta's presentation where she just shared with us how the government has been taking this time to lead it and they've been planning ahead, they were innovating, they were putting in the research, they were testing the technologies, finding the cooperation. So the technology itself uh, is available for a long time uh, for many. For example, um, I remember once um, <clears throat> we had a meeting with the delegation of um, Republic of Korea, they were sharing their advancement um, in the uh, digital government and transformation. And it came down to the fact that they've been investing in the field for the last 30 to 40 years, starting with the simplest things of standardization of how they collect the data, how they digital, how they move the processes towards. There's a lot of background work behind the scenes uh, that allows the technology to function. Uh, for example, on open government data portals, right? This is a recent trend and we were very happy to note that in the world there is an uh, uh, uptake uh, in opening the government data in public formats and sharing it. As um, Marta has rightly mentioned, the government is the largest owner of the data in general, but to make use of that, you need to figure out a way to, uh, first of all, standardize and systematize the data and converting, making it in online um, open formats, but also think about how you're going to share the data from this point onwards, uh, how you're going to make the processes automated and reliable and how to secure the pub, uh, private information of people, how to make sure that uh, the data is not uh, recompiled together and people's uh, rights for privacy is not violated. These are all works that require uh, of the government to shift the mindset from what existed over the last maybe two, 300 years of bureaucracy to something that is right now so much available. Technology enables you, but you still need to answer those hard questions. And in order for innovation to occur, there are so many wheels that need to run concurrently together uh, to pick it up. Uh, that's why we do sh stress a lot that it's not only about the creating a website, for example, or putting some services online. Uh, for people to make the use of it, they need to be ready themselves. They need to have the digital literacy skills. They need to have the access to internet. Uh, in many parts of the world, the internet penetration rate doesn't go above 15% uh, anyway right now. So if you consider that with uh, almost universal coverage in one region with versus 15% of the coverage of the, uh, the other region, even if the service online is perfectly there, the use of it and then convenience of it will not uh, generate the benefits for the society. That's why we always stress that um, the, it's a transformation of the mindset and making the technology serve people. And yes, making the public right. administrations, uh, making the public administration systems uh, think in a people-centric way. Mohammed has, uh, in his presentation, already stressed it that for the government to be relevant, it needs to actually go to people-centric services to create ecosystems that uh, allow the technology. That you're using the um, sort of front. Uh, page or front service of it, but uh, in order for it to be useful for you, user friendly and then reliable, there's a huge background work that needs to be done. And undermining or underestimating uh, the importance of those, this, that work and putting the technology as such in a forerunner, <clears throat> sometimes what causes the governments to stumble upon uh, problems because uh, it takes a lot of thinking uh, time. It requires a lot of alignment of the legal frameworks, um, the institutional frameworks, and finally just a groundwork. Uh, we can take decades for the technology to deliver. Yeah, so. actually um, a lot of articles on uh, Harvard Business Review uh, taken from research on digital transformation applied on companies, suggesting that uh, the, the most difficult challenges facing digital transformation usually is culture, not the technology. So mm -hmm. the culture may be the ecosystem. Yeah. So, Mohammed, moving to you, because uh, Arbine just mentioned, yeah, you, you, you were the one who mentioned uh, 
uh, this uh, context. So, uh, Mohammed, uh, this question from, let's say, another uh, perspective. Now, uh, we, we seem like we jumped like uh, five, ten years in the future. All of us, governments just between day and night uh, moved to digital governments. That, that's why we saw this great uh, results. Uh, do you think this great leap in the future with the uh, e-government uh, uh, is something um, sustainable or it's just a temporarily because of the force of the new reality? And how do you think government should grab this momentum and take it forward? Extremely important question. And um, let me start by first uh, maybe amplifying what we are talking about here. We are trying to make an impact in the lives of people. The role of government is to enable people to live, in my opinion, a healthy, fulfilling, happy, satisfied life. And technology is a means to an end. We have to adopt to the environment we work in, otherwise we become irrelevant, any one of us, whether we are a business individual or a uh, government. And look at COVID-19 as a situation. If we hadn't pivoted as individuals to communicating via web technology, our mobile, etc., all of us were pretty much isolated in our homes. So the way of surviving and connecting and staying connected with the world was to actually change our behaviors to adopt to the new reality we were living in, whether this is temporary or is forever, regardless. So we know before even COVID, the travel of direction was to look at much more communication, much more of socializing, much more of entertainment and connectivity, with the device and you be able to use that as a mechanism. So definitely I see the momentum will continue. I would, however, say this is our opportunity to really rethink. We have been presented, COVID has really brought it to the surface and presented with a great opportunity to rethink how we operate the model of government that is much more connected with its constituents, people it, it serves or is there to serve, and enables also a mind shift in the minds of the citizens themselves as well. We cannot, as citizens, expect government to be the only one who does everything and solve all problems. The problems that we, we have today are too big. They're much bigger than any one of us on our own to solve. So we have to look at a much more of an ecosystem and a collaborative approach. Citizens need to play their role. Governments need to play their role. Businesses need to be playing their role. Academia needs to play their role. National and international institutions like UN and uh, World Bank, et cetera, need to play their role. So unless we bring these all together to reimagine a better future, and we drive it from the lens of the, the user or citizens we are to serve or businesses we serve. That mind shift change has to happen. As Arpin has said, if we are going to be technology led and we look at this as a technology problem, we will always find technology as the solution to it. It is not a technology problem. It is a operating model problem that we are trying to resolve. And think, just to connect one thing in there, most businesses look at having a function which is about connecting with its customer base. Yet today in government, I don't know which government actually has that model where it has a, a uh, connecting point which is about citizen experience. And this is something why I brought it up as number one focus, because I feel there's a layer missing in government today. Between the citizens and the government, there's a layer missing. We are forcing citizens to be driven to deal with government in a siloed way, to putting the complication and effort on the citizen versus the, you know, versus the government. So that layer, which I call experience layer, is missing. We need to be, as government, thinking about 
what experience we want to be giving to our people and then bringing technology to enable that. And that's why I say it's not about digital government. It's not about e-government. Well, we need to pivot. Okay. Is it okay, Mohammed, uh, to experiment in this uh, in this level? We might uh, do some mistakes, but let's uh, move uh, forward. Uh, experimentation now is part of the uh, business. Uh, no, I, I think trend. it's a, it's a norm, right? So we need to to innovate means experiment, and okay. uh, don't take my word for it. Let's ask every mm -hmm. citizen what they want, what they want government to do differently and how they want government to dif act in the future, what they want them to do. And probably we will find very similar because what I'm giving you is based on different uh, angles. I work in government. I'm a, I call myself a roaming citizen. I'm a national of the UK, but it's been 20 years since I've been roaming, living in different places around the world. So mm -hmm. I, as a, as a roaming citizen, I'm experiencing, you know, living in New Zealand, I experienced a different, living in uh, this part of the world, different in a Asia, different. So uh, that insights is helping me think about, mm. and, and when I interact with different people, whether it's businesses and, and governments or my counterparts, I'm getting a very interesting picture, which is emerging, which is, I think there is a need for a rethink. Sorry, a long question <laughs> answer, but I wanted to make sure that the importance of it was felt. It's not a technology problem we are yeah. trying to solve. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so uh, moving to Marta. Marta, um, you were maybe responsible for um, filling in uh, the UN government survey from your side as a government. And uh, uh, I mean, you dealt with it and with all questions. Uh, we need to just to share with us, because we, because we know uh, the figures uh, showing where is the Serbia in this uh, report, but we don't know some cases about uh, or examples from Serbia and the initiatives you have done from the e governments. And as you experienced uh, th this uh, shift or transformation toward e government in Serbia or in a previous job with Macedonia, um, tell us more about uh, why it was maybe very slow moving toward digital transformation before COVID. And when COVID came, we were able. We were all able to do the things we were we all considered before as impossible. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you for that question. So, um, you know, when when we speak about the the, the COVID and, and pre-COVID and post-COVID time, um, basically, uh, what happened? Uh, caused by the virus from the period of March to May, uh, it was especially productive for, for the Serbia e government. So it's like one and a half or two months. So um, we have designed many solutions and many of them uh, has been nominated uh, to um, ITU or to OECD innovation trackers. But they, th those solutions range from innovation calls, you know, from the day one. So government decided that they are not going to they, they don't have the entire knowledge in the world to uh, you know to cope with the situation so they launched uh, innovation calls and challenges for the companies for the smes and the citizens to help you know uh, uh, cope with specific tasks and this is how we got the first for example serbian um, ventilator and then we have uh, we we received a very innovative messaging system that has been deployed to the healthcare institutions and to healthcare workers then we received apps for volunteering for solidarity sharing even for plasma you know for volunteering to donate plasma so those are the things that we 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 just got there in the first uh, let's say month or two uh, from uh, during the the crisis. What else was really important is that um, we have managed for that period to build the entire education online. So Serbia, since the day one, since the day they stopped uh, allowing uh, children to schools. They have transferred it the next day. Everything was transferred online. The, the, the entire education system, even it was televised on the, on the national broadcasters. So the entire school program was televised for the ones that are not connected to internet or they don't have means 
to use the the you know the digital online education. Otherwise, all the online con all the all the digital content was put online on on the websites, um, and that helped uh, Serbia to be one of the top five productive countries in terms of innovation during uh, digital government uh, and the COVID in the COVID situation. Besides that. I would like to share some of the signature projects of the Serbian government. The Serbian government is, let's say, famous for, and that's uh, the education end-to-end -end services. This is really important. So enrollment in kindergarten, in primary school, and in, in, in high school um, are, uh, let's say, trademark services for the Serbian government. They're called, for example, eBaby, um, e-enrollment, you know, e-baby is very famous and because it's nothing to do with the oh, parents. Scary. Sorry? Freaking, freaking, freaking uh, scary to say e-baby. Uh, Why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we, we, we think uh, we'll become like objects and devices. Uh, e-baby is um, e-registration e e of a baby, basically. But, you know, when you say e-baby, it means that there's nothing to do, a parent has, has nothing to do when a mother and father, when a child is born, and then has it has been included in the system, received all the, benefi uh, the benefits and uh, everything uh, in just uh, one single, let's say, uh, online service. Uh, then a very important thing that I want to share with you is the unified education information system that Serbia is developing. And that's um, uh, every, every child, uh, uh, since their enrollment in the kin kin kindergarten, they, they received unique ID, education unique number, uh, uh, that has followed this kid throughout his entire education, so primary and secondary school and university until his first employment. So uh, this system is using big data and complex data analysis to calculate the quality of the educational institutions, the cost of education and many other aspects and parameters based on which the government is designing the education policies. And uh, of course, to be able to do that, I, I, I have to mention that the, the digitalization itself and the education have been top priorities of the government, especially of, um, of our prime minister. So uh, those are, let's say, the, 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 the brands of Serbia in terms of digitalization. And uh, this has been done for not more than three years when the, the, the prime minister take uh, her office. But with a strong vision and with a strong dedication, this is uh, how we managed to have uh, this good result on the um, on the UN government survey. And if you allow me, I can I would like to 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 speak about our um, you know how do we use it and what is our experience. But I don't know if that's um, uh, yeah I'll, we may, we may come back to this. Uh, but thank, thank you. you for sharing these uh, signatures of your country. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'll move to you, uh, Marta, uh, with a question from one of our audience. Uh, he's asking, uh, what is uh, the optimal or proven uh, governance structure in a country to drive digital uh, at government level? Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, several ministers, uh, regulators, departments in every country, and he mentioned uh, CIO, I, I remember I saw it in the survey, so you were asking government if they have chief information officer or so. How, how can you answer uh, the, the well, question? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, sorry, sorry, this is for, uh, this is for uh, Arbin. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you. Uh, okay. Arbin. Okay, um, that's an excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, and I think uh, Marta has the hands-on experience of trying to test and then most likely she has been studying uh, the experiences of different countries and then what worked there, what's not. Uh, relying on the survey data that we have it because we also look into institutional arrangements that countries put in place and then whether that correlates better or you know, supports in a way the government development. Um, it does emerge that um, while the structures can be many, uh, you can have uh, an appointed uh, CTO or you can have an um, information officer, 
and technology officer in a country, a ministry, uh, something uh, separately, completely um, reporting to the prime minister or to the cabinet. There are, the arrangements are all very different. Uh, what does emerge to, however, in terms of what, it, what function does it perform, that it does have to have a, a coordinating and leadership uh, role within the government. So whatever is there to concentrate a little bit um, on uh, policy framework creation, online um, services uh, sort of standards creation in one area that will have the ability to push for the um, institutional change. So uh, the arrangements can be different. What is important is to make sure that there is a consistent way of looking at the problems and then pushing for, for that. In the UK, that, uh, that's uh, an entity that, uh, that directly reports to the uh, prime minister. And it is sort of within the cabinet, but doesn't have a ministerial status. Um, in um, many other countries that could be rather decentralized, every ministry will have its own entity that drives it, but there is still some uh, entity that coordinates. So the short answer to the question would be, there is no single um, one fit for all solution. It has to be uh, extensively reviewed within a country context, what responsibilities these ministries have, um, and um, whether the human capacities actually would allow um, in each of the ministries to employ a team of people to uh, run the agenda forward. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the importance trend that emerges, it is more successful and more uh, sort of coherent when there is an entity that has enough authority to move, drive the agenda forward, to set the vision and to drive the agenda forward. And the closer it is to the decision making level, the better. So. Great. So, uh, yeah, very interesting. Um, so, Mohammed, I'll move to you. Um, uh, I'll ask you a question. Uh, talking about e-government uh, actually uh, raises the question uh, about uh, this, the, the government services, how government services would be shifted with the e-governments. Uh, many experts, including yourself, uh, uh, reading your articles or uh, your thoughts, um, uh, we, uh, we received this notion of uh, moving from reactive services to proactive services. So can you tell us more about and uh, how, how the proactive serv government services would look like and uh, how governments should be prepared for such a huge move? So, so let me let me tell that in maybe uh, taking a use case example and uh, what I what I mean at least from proactive. But I think there's another lens as well, what I call predictive. So we have been good as government in delivering services. Okay, there is a service we deliver it. Uh, passport, I'll pick as an example to to elab uh, illustrate what it means. So most cases you need a passport to obviously travel. Uh, and we won't get into the discussion about even that. To me, travel documents need to be potentially reimagined. You know, why do we even need a passport in the first place uh, to travel? You know, that's a different uh, question to, to think of. And, and we should be thinking of because digital is allowing us to rethink because I'm, I'm who I'm saying I am. How do you ensure that I am identified as me? And how do I have the, the right to travel. That can be digitally somehow secured and available. I mean, Estonia is a great model where they have a digital ID and even link your rights of uh, driving and others to that so that you don't have to necessarily carry all your different documents. So put that one aside, that, is a, that I think is ne one of the areas open for potential reimagination. But let's say passport, we want to apply for it. Typically, we will apply for it if it's uh, not the first time I'm doing it. Let's assume I have done it before and many times. We still have to apply for it. Why isn't it that the government takes the complication and the burden away from me as a, as a user and takes it onto themselves? They know when it's going to expire. So why isn't it that I can receive a push notification saying that your passport is expiring in three days or three months? Let's make it. Uh, would you like us to send you a new passport? Uh, swipe right. Yes. Swipe no. I'll do it in my own time. I swipe right. And the next question they ask me, are all your details still up to date? Would you like to make any changes? And I say, swipe right. No. Or swipe less. I want to make changes. I swipe right. Job done. 
two clicks, three clicks, your service is done. And the, the message you get is you'll get your passport in seven days. That's what I'm calling as a proactive service. Predictive is I have chosen to provide government with data um, about, and I'm very uh, particular about data rights and who owns the data. I own the data, you own the data, Arpene owns the data about themselves. It, 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 nobody owns the data, you own the data. Yes, the custodian could be, it could be sitting with government, it could be sitting with a bank, it could be sitting somewhere else, but actually you're the owner, it should be that way. So I, I give right to government that my travel details can be recorded, can be kept. So now the government knows I'm traveling and going a lot around the world. Predictive could be that the government sees that, you know, I've been doing so much travel that potentially my passport could have run out of pages. And it sends me a notification saying, hey, Muhammad, I see that uh, your passport is not expiring for three years, but you've been doing so much travel. Do you have enough passports or would you like me to send that to you? That's so now Muhammad getting to... Yeah. yeah, what you have suggested is that government should uh, play or work in the mentality of the private sector or startup. So this uh, absolutely is the question of the competition. So should we expect now a severe competition between private sector and governments and governments uh, that are not able? I, I saw, uh, I saw, I, um, seen you, uh, Marta, you have something to say in this. I'll, I'll move to you after Mohammed. So should, should government consider that, okay, we either compete the private sector in providing services or we outsource uh, to the private sector? What do you think? So, so I think I alluded to this in my, my uh, presentation earlier. I think it's not, uh, one is not one size fits all and every government has to think about their contractual uh, situation and uh, requirements. But I think we should be all moving towards a collaborative model of delivery. I think governments should be much more minim I, I think the minimalistic approach being as, as minimalist as possible, doing those things which are much more core and important that we know protects the rights so, of citizens and are important from a security perspective and potentially looking at enabling an ecosystem for service delivery and moving much more towards supporting. So I think the only competition possibly government is gonna have with the, with the private sector is the competition for talent. Because the more and more we move towards technology and I, not just technology, but experience becoming the driver for government thinking and services, you are now competing with that talent, which is very, very unique and few. And especially, as I mentioned, if we are going to build data analytics as the core of government, that's a skill set that everyone is looking for. And already we know in the world is a shortage. And we know also that the more we go online, the more we become in the, in the, in the digital world, the, the security challenges shift from borders security to much more security in the online space, which their responsibility becomes much bigger. Great. So, Marta, um, back to you. Uh, I need to ask you from your experience uh, in Serbia, how did you deal with this? Did you, I mean, do you think you, you are going to face in any future a competition? or a collaboration, maybe a government uh, will outsource or not. I mean, share with us the practical experience you have on this. Uh, well, um, the, the collaboration, collaboration would be the right word. Uh, there's no competition uh, between government and, and, and public sector as well. Um, because what I see, and we've talked this with Mohammed, um, um, when we, we have this brainstorming sessions <laughs> about the future of government and um, government should be more considered as a public service enabler, you know, to enable the environment for public service provision, for service provision at the end, instead of uh, provider of the services. In order to create that kind of environment, government have to be open to collaborate with the private sector, with startups, with academia. I mean, uh, if everybody, all the stakeholders in the, let's say, ecosystem. So um, 
this open innovation is the concept that I, uh, I really uh, urge the governments to, to implement. And also when, you know, the governments, uh, they, they, they have this problem because they don't have the knowledge, the, the human capital, uh, and sometimes the resources to, you know, provide the state of the art solutions that do, don't know about them. Because, you know, we have public servants that are kind of underpaid if you compare them to the uh, IT experts. So uh, if there are employees in the government that are art IT experts, they might go to some private company where they can be paid more. So um, the knowledge uh, about the, the technology, the knowledge about the customer experience, the knowledge about the service provision, this is something that the private sector has uh, on a better uh, scale. So this is why I, I, I think that the collaboration uh, you see is the, the right word. So how can you promote this kind of collaboration? Because we know that government procures, government has procurement laws and government have to, you know, design the specification of something and then, uh, you know, whoever is there can apply. But we have seen many innovation in the public procurement already. So there has been, you know, you can buy, there is a public procurement based on innovation there's some interesting, uh, um, interesting models that we have seen around the world, especially in Italy. When you have a special kind of call for the companies that are startups, you see there are startups and you can, uh, you, you're not fulfilling the, all the conditions, but you are registered as an innovative company or innovative startup, and you are eligible to apply on a call when government, for example, Ministry of Finance is purchasing data analytics tool or big, big data or whatever. So there, there are some ways that government can be open and flexible, but that means that government have to change their own regulation because otherwise they, they, they couldn't be, you know, uh, that couldn't be uh, possible to do without with this, um, let's say old school laws that have been there for, for many years, not to say centuries. Yeah, this is a great point, actually, uh, changing the regulations to fit for the digital era is something very important, as, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, this question, maybe just after asking uh, Arbine, this question uh, came a lot of, uh, from our audience asking about how to calculate the survey results and how to verify the information uh, gathered and one of our uh, audience is asking specifically you mentioned you need to get a feedback from a random uh, volunteers as a sample for survey how the surveyed individuals are picked do you need to get a sort of uh, uh, authorization or approval from the government to collect such, such info uh, uh, no actually that's not a feedback from uh, random volunteers um, the way the process is organized is that there are 193 countries and um, no in-house team can possess the number of languages required to do the assessments. So we rely heavily on the online volunteers uh, from each country, the native speakers um, who can, it doesn't have to be from a country. It could be, for example, an Arabic speaker who can assess a number of uh, sort of Arab language native websites, for example, or one Russian speaker can have a number of Russian speakers and so forth, right? So it is important that we cover all native languages that are available for the member states. So the way we go about it is that we recruit online volunteers. There is a call for online volunteers and any individual can uh, apply for it. And as a matter of fact, we're um, trying to make sure that it's not a government um, employee that answers the questions because the assumption behind having uh, the assessment is that any human being, any individual, any citizen, uh, who is um, literate enough can go online and navigate the web pages and uh, use the services that they need and find information that they need and then navigate through it in a user friendly way. So in principle, that should be any anyone really. So it doesn't matter whether it's a government official or non government official that is doing it. 
However, we do right. collect also the data from the government because there is a member state questionnaire that we um, request each member state to prepare and uh, share with us before the survey actually even starts. They can do it along the way as well, but mostly before the survey so that we, for example, have the uh, co correct uh, uh, national portal links, the ministries links that are responsible for that, uh, the services, the frameworks uh, that they put in place, the institutional arrangements that they have it. We could do collect that information from the member states. And um, we're happy to say that since we've done it, um, we introduced the member state questionnaire in 2018. And uh, by now it's 100, almost 140 country that, 139 to be precise, that filled in the member state questionnaire. Uh, this is additional source of information for us. We um, triangulate the data, we cross check with the government data and we make sure that the researchers who are going online and trying to do um, the assessment of 148 country do have uh, you know, quality control. So it's not random. And each website is assessed at least by two person. They don't know about each other. And then we do check their answers for discrepancies. Uh, if there are a lot of discrepancies, they have to go back and then review their uh, survey. And every time when they are answering a question and there is a yes answer to it, there should be a link attached to it, which is verifiable. Uh, and there's um, a group of people at the UNDESA itself, including myself, that goes through the answers uh, we pick up discrepancies, we look into the consistencies with the government provided information, we clean the data, if there are questions, we return it to the researchers, they get back to us. So the whole process of online survey assessments is pretty rigorous. Uh, and uh, in order to have the scale of 193 countries, we do need to have um, an army of actually uh, researchers that are doing the work and uh, verifying the data and then covering all languages needed. Uh, so it's not as random as it seems. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a pretty rigorous process, um, which allows us and to... And the methodology is there, is there in the report. They can read it. Yes, uh, you yeah. the criteria, the questions are all in the report. You can look into it and understand better if you want to under the, um, right. have the methodology. Right. So yeah. ni um, almost 90 minutes uh, passed very quickly. And uh, our audience, actually, many of them, they asked to uh, host each one of you in a separate uh, webinar so they can get more information from you. So I'll, I'll uh, make the last round asking you about your final uh, thoughts. Uh, uh, Mohammed, uh, what are the things uh, government should keep in mind uh, for their digital transformation efforts? I mean, tell them their, your final thoughts on this. I think uh, just to keep it very simple, I think there's a need for much more connectivity in how the government looks at their digital transformation, number one. So it is uh, not lost, action is not, effort is not lost. Each one is not doing their own thing. So there is a need for looking at uh, connectivity, rationalizing, making sure that we are all putting effort um, which is going to yield us better results rather than each one trying to do the same thing. That's one. Number two, I think we need to really look at the fundamentals uh, that uh, make up a, a, a truly digital government. So putting in place those different building blocks like digital identity, like uh, the way of how you can digitize all different documentation and how do you do communication of the future with your citizens? Is it paper-based or digital-based? So some these are these models which will make it much more uh, easy for customers, uh, citizens to transact online. And, th and third and final, which is the most important for me is that I still believe that we, if we took a technology led approach, we will end up in a, in a different place to if we took a experience led approach and governments, if I, if I want to sort of par use a fame, you know, something I always talk about, governments should be driven by purpose. Their digital investments should be driven by purpose. It should be very clear what they're trying to achieve, the outcomes they want, the impact they want, so they can measure the impact and not the, the process of getting there itself. So experience becomes quite central. So as I always say, bring purpose to digital in government. Let's make it work for us and get the best value out of it. Excellent final thoughts. Uh, so, Marta, to you, uh, your, fi your final thoughts on this. Um, 
Well, I I would like to congratulate um, to Arpine and the entire team for the, this report. And it, I just want to make sure that uh, in the audience, because I've seen I, I see many questions that are related to the report and to the rankings in the report. I want to um, give a different light on the report. You see, um, for us. In, in Macedonia first, but then in Serbia, it turns out to be, you know, we, we thought that the report is a benchmark that uh, we can use to check um, uh, what is our standing or what is our relative position uh, to a neighboring countries or in the region or in the world. And, and that what the edgy index was one of the inputs, input indexes in, in other reports that are relevant for country positioning, for example, for the global competitiveness report. And it was, it is how it started. It was report. It was important for us to improve our rankings. You know, this is how we started. But then, um, when we deep uh, deep dive into the details of the report and the methodology, we found out that it can become a tool uh, that is useful for our further development. So not only for our ranking. And our ranking became a kind of irrelevant. You see. And the less importance when we see what is the real value, uh, basically, of the report. We dissected the indexes, especially the OC1, the o o Online Service Index, and we learned that we should, what we should do, in fact, what are the steps and what are the, our strategy should be based and what are the action plans that we should design based on the uh, OSI index. And, and this has been done before that. We are doing this and that and this and that, but not in a such a, let's say, organized and a systemic manner. So it, it helped us really um, um, be, 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 uh, to design, to, to improve and to rethink our digital government and our strategy. And this is my, my message to everybody. So, if you if you are looking at this report, look at as a as a guidebook, as a manual for a country that wants to improve uh, the e-government offering and quality and efficiency, and the rating only as a consequence. Hamoud, before you move on, may, may I just say because uh, uh, there's a very important point that uh, Martez make, and it's really we should as governments embrace the spirit of. The, the survey and the index. What is it intending to do? And the spirit is about driving governments to become citizen centric. Whether you are digital or not digital is irrelevant at the end of the day. And this is what is what I think Marta is saying and it's extremely important that we embrace the spirit. Sorry, just wanted to share that. Thank you for this follow up. Uh, so, uh, Arbine, uh, it's to you maybe uh, all of this saying, uh, finally uh, come to you. So please tell us your final thoughts. Thanks, Hamoud. And probably I couldn't be happier hearing Martha actually explain so well how to use the EGDI because um, there is a tendency for the member states and governments to actually look at the ranking in a, in a pure value and uh, be uncomfortable when the numbers are going up or down and there are a little bit of drops in here. Well, they complain that how comes we've invested so much or done a lot of things, but then numbers are actually not growing or going down. Uh, once again, I want to emphasize the fact that it is a benchmarking tool and um, it helps the policy making to see in a continuum of things and to see in a changing environment because it is a ranking between zero and one. Obviously, if there are, the world is moving fast and you're not moving fast enough with it, your ranking will be affected because it's going to be fitting with a small, you know, predefined set. It doesn't mean that you didn't work well. You may have done all the same things and even better, but it gives you a sense, a proxy of where you stand with the world development, right? And it's very, as I mentioned, uh, compared to last uh, edition of the survey 2018, there was a 50% decline in the low EGDI level group. Uh, there are only eight countries right now that are in that category. There was a time there were 20 plus more countries, right? And vice versa. This year we have 57 countries as opposed to 40 last year. Obviously, the higher you go in your government development, the performance become closer and more similar. So looking into the numbers itself, like 
by itself uh, doesn't help you um, as much as looking into more in-depth analysis of your online services performance, of how your uh, investments if uh, bringing benefits in human capital or infrastructure, right? So um, again, I'm very happy with the uh, discussion of the panel and see that um, uh, Martha has herself said that they're using it as a tool to understand better um, how they can change their own service delivery. And ultimately what Mohammed says, it's about uh, the convenience and uh, service uh, provision to the people, to the citizens and how to make their life better using the technology. Uh, E-government development um, index is helping the government to see overall picture within a country. It doesn't suggest that uh, you need to change your online services dramatically or you need to invest only your human capital. No, everybody understand that it's a, a sort of puzzle that requires a number of pieces to come together to make the uh, forward leap. Uh, but at the same time, it helps you to also see where the uh, little, you know, bottlenecks are. So, and if you want to learn more about it, the survey is all online, the webinars will be there. I want to also mention that um, in September, there will be a regional launch in Arab region. Uh, we're co-organizing with our Economic and Social Commission for West Africa uh, and the survey launch specifically for the Arab region. So those of you who are interested in uh, learning more or in depth, please follow the news on our website and then join it. Thanks. Great. Great and well said. Thank you so much, um, Arbine. So as we learned, uh, this survey, I mean, the survey this year just uh, showed us um, uh, promising uh, figures, uh, about maybe almost two thirds of uh, the global um, uh, countries uh, just moved to high or higher um, uh, level of a GDI, which is uh, something uh, uh, was like a dream maybe a, a year ago and maybe this uh, also uh, will impose a question in my mind just at, uh, I mean be, before um, I mean in, in the 70s when the technology circuits uh, started there was a, a law called a more law so law uh, more the, he was a scientist expecting that technology circuits will double every two years and uh, now I remember um, the survey every two years because the digital transformation of governments uh, was slow. Maybe uh, after a few years, um, more slow just stopped because the technology um, was doubled maybe every few months sometimes. So maybe in the very uh, short coming future, maybe you, you reconsider the frequency of the survey. Yep, um, that's all right. Uh, it, yeah. It's coming faster nowadays. So great. Thank you so much, our uh, great panelists, our great audience. Thank you for our panelists. Uh, Mohammed Sir, Associate uh, Partner uh, for, digital, uh, government, uh, for Digital Government and Public Sector Consulting at EY MENA. Uh, thank you, uh, Arbine uh, Korikian, uh, Governance and Public Administration Officer at uh, the Division uh, for Public Institution and Digital Government. Uh, uh, UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Thank you, uh, Marta Tomoviska, uh, Director of the PAR Team uh, Performance uh, Assessment Review uh, and uh, the Advisor for um, IT and the EU Government at the Prime Minister Office of Republic of Serbia. Thank you all and thank you for our audience. Uh, see you next week. Thank, you, thank, you, very thank much. you, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. It Thanks. was great.